Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Next up, we have our home team, University of Washington, with Loom, a storytelling experience for your tight-knit community. So, um, we are from the University of Washington's Division of Design. Um, I am Jennifer. This is Charlotte, Catherine, Jaywan, and Kendall, and we're really excited to share our project with you today. Loom is a tool for friends and family to collectively weave stories. A bit about how we got here, um, we were really interested in the social experiences of older adults, um, an area that is far less um, uh, explored or designed for than, for example, the medical aspects of aging. To better understand this space, we reached out to the Wallingford Community Senior Center um, and were able to spend some time there. We served lunch and visited a few times and were able to spend time with people at the center uh, to better understand the social context of older adults. And we did this through observation and simply sitting down and having conversations with them. One thing we noticed was the popularity of tabletop games like dominoes or bridge. Um, and the director of the center shared a really valuable insight with us that activities that people think of as more sedentary or passive uh, actually serve a very important purpose to keep people connected and for cognitive simulation. One particularly, uh, particularly moving example of this at the senior center um, is the knitting circle that has been around for 40 years, um, getting people to just sit down, engage in conversation. Um, and we ran with this metaphor of the knitting circle as we wanted, as we designed um, a physical prompt for storytelling. So Loom is a tool to just get people sitting and talking um, and to weave conversations and memories. So when people talk about a family photo, um, they usually start with one story and then branch off into many different stories related to that one story. Loom actually captures the connections between these memories in addition to the memories themselves. And once we had this idea, we wanted to try and explore it and expand it with Yoko and Ichi, a great couple we met at the Senior Center. And so we quickly developed our prototype and then asked them to just share their family stories with us and our video is a documentation of the experience they had. Next month, um, it will be 58 years. He's 92 and I'm 85. He likes to look at old pictures. Nice memories will come back and so he enjoys that. Every time he gets a chance, he would love to tell the stories. But the stories, countless. My father went up to Mount Rainier, you know, and he, he made it up. When you look at the picture, when it looks like he's the tallest one. And I think I it's think good for our family our children and grandchildren to know what kind of life he had and what kind of hardship he overcame and he never gave up. My father went up to Mount Rainier, you know, and he, he made it up. He had lots of friends. Although most people passed away, that's, but looking at the, all the pictures, you know, and he likes to think about uh, the people he met all through his life. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, that that must be the flag that my father put up there. <laughs> so, I think that each story comes alive, you know, it's, uh, it's true to them, yeah. What was 
Nice talk to you. I'm glad I know all about you now. I know that you talk to me. So by spending time with Ichi, we saw how excited he was to use Loom to share stories and recount his family history, but we also learned a little bit about how to further develop our concept. So in the video, um, we used prototypes made out of old iPhones and realized that the size was actually a little bit small, which leads us to imagine that the Loom system could actually be applied across a whole variety of larger devices. Um, this also means that even old devices could be upcycled by simply adding a wooden frame um, to give it more warmth and a friendlier feeling. We also realized that we take the complexity of touch interactions for granted. So for ET, distinguishing between tap and tap and hold wasn't really possible. So we decided to minimize the touch interface and instead focus more on voice direction to create a more accessible uh, multi-input experience. So the way the system works, um, when Ichi tells his stories, Loom records them and um, attaches them to a specific photo. This content lives in the cloud, and photos can come from existing photo sharing services, such as Facebook or Instagram, that Loom could build on top of, or people could choose to upload individual photos. Um, and because this content is in the cloud, Ichi can not only access his photos when he's at home, but also when he's in the senior center or when he's visiting family and friends. And having multiple devices allows for the same type of collaborative activity that prompts storytelling um, that the knitting circle um, does that we've discovered in the senior center. And because you can use any number of devices, the system is really flexible in allowing you to tell a great variety of stories. So as you saw in our video, we toyed with this idea of arrangements. But we d what we discovered was that the placement of the devices isn't really what matters. What's more important is that Loom captures the individual threads that connect these stories together. For example, in this photo, when Yoko and Ichi were telling the story together, their story is linked to the gestures that they make on the photograph, visualizing the experience of that conversation, like who told which part of the story and what, what area of the photograph they pointed to. This narrative context adds a deeper layer of meaning to the photos, and these can be played back and shared with family and friends so that they can get details that are not uh, immediately apparent in that photograph. Shared across generations, these memories come alive. And we think that the potential of Loom offers um, the ability to apply to other contexts. Um, such as schools, the workplace, or museums. Really any other number of social contexts where a physical object can prompt conversation. One of the most touching experiences that we had throughout this process is that moment captured in the video where Mary says, you talk, I know that you talk now. And it's because she had never really heard him speak. This is because HE has some loss of hearing and that sometimes prevents him from being able to engage in conversation. But we really saw him sort of come alive and open up and tell these amazing stories uh, with those family photos in front of him to the point where we basically couldn't get him to stop talking. Um, and this really speaks to the potential transformative value of Loom. Like an actual Loom, this is a tool that you weave with. And the outcome of this is a continuously growing fabric composed of the narrative threads from the most important people in your life. Thank you. Thank you, University of Washington. Who would like to go first? So, so where are you guys now um, in, the, in the product development phase? I mean, is this something that's out and people can download it as an app, or, or where is it? <laughs> Still at the conceptual level. All right, cool. To explore this idea. Yeah, that, that's, really, um, that's really great. I, I, I really find this to be very meaningful, um, and I r really like it. I, I always debate, you know, there's... there's um, what you're introducing is essentially a microphone with a photo, right? So the technology is actually very, very simple, but what you're providing is the context for this to occur. 
Um, and, and, that's, um, and that's an area that can work or, or sometimes doesn't work. It really depends on the, the thing. Um, here, I think it really can work. I think there's a lot of potential to the idea um, because, you know, uh, while a network like, I don't know, Facebook can add a functionality to record, you know, sound over a photo, and that would be a feature for Facebook, the contextual nature of having an app that gives you kind of that closeness to your family is actually the only place where you really kind of want that kind of depth for most photos, I think, or where you'd really consume that um, experience. So, um, so that's really exciting. Um, I really like the brand. I think you guys have really nailed the, the, the word. It's just so good for it. I just really <laughs> like it. Um, and, um, and I think the, the simplicity uh, really, really helps, especially with the demographic that you're working with there. So um, you know, I, I encourage you to look at, um, I haven't done this research, but any, any networks that pertain to family that already exist um, you know, could be threatening to you, or you might want to become that network quite directly as a thought. Um, but, um, but I think the brand would work for both, right? So, so it was very promising and, you know, happy to talk to you guys another time if, if it helped. Uh, yeah, very nicely presented and put together and, um, projects. Uh, very, very engaging video. I did have to, you know, I was like, it would be embarrassing if I cry. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> um, that was lovely. I mean, you did a, you know, the video was 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 really well done, and, um, you know, a little bit sushy, but that was okay. And you know, and the fact that you had, you you thought about the inclusiveness of your video and included subtitles, which I think was kind of a good touch. Um, I kept thinking about almost like the literal out of box here. Um, you know, and thinking, you you kind of uh, fudge this a little bit about well, the photos can come from anywhere. But I think really thinking about how you move from a sort of online repository of photos to how many of these things do you actually have, and how does that picture get on it, and what what that's like. Um, I you know I feel like that would be incredibly central to that experience of. Um, of setting it up, I think that felt re that would feel really important, and um, I, I think it's worth spending time on that. Much like you had about okay, well, I can't do all that swiping and stuff. You know, you need to have a very simple interaction. So, how do you make that whole setup experience simple? I think would be vital. But really nice project. Yeah, I um, I commend you guys on the video storytelling, and uh, there's this little detail which probably everybody noticed, but I. You know, on viewing it a second time, noticed again, which is the the fact that the wife of the uh, participant, the central participant, is actually narrating the story, which you you sort of forget the storytelling elegance of that um, as a, you know, it's not you guys telling the story. It's it's actually you know somebody who's been affected by the concept um, and seen the transformative effect it had on on um, on their partner. So um, that that video is really quite masterful. Um, congratulations on that. Um, I feel like the concept, uh, I feel very similar, like there's a lot of, um, just because it's such a simple idea of tying sort of the, the narrative, the storytelling to the to the picture and having that recording um, and the sharing and the sort of longevity of that idea, those ideas and stories um, for a family. It's such a simple thing that, but there's so many kind of horrible barriers for getting, you know, even those photographs digitized and where, where to put them and the setup experience and, I, and again I feel like it's you, you you definitely skipped over a lot of that detail and maybe it's all done I, you know I don't know the extent of which you've explored this but um, it feels like um, many of those uh, many of the the power of this idea would come to life in those moments um, and the fact that it would be a very successful service that I'm sure would have actual real commercial value if you could if you could get those experiences nailed and um, and really, really think about that kind of, you know, that long, long user experience um, um, from from first touch to several years later, a relative stumbling upon and hearing the story for the first time. Um, so there's some some great work here. Um, I encourage you to keep going. Um, it's, it's it's really really solid. Any questions from the audience?
Rachel Banks. This is great, really enjoyed it. I, re I really like that idea particularly of giving old devices a second life, that kind of renewal. I think one question for you is actually about the future uh, as much about the system as it is um, currently, because what you're doing to some extent is building a system of legacy. Um, so there's a question about what happens to all this content and what happens to all the artifacts when these people unfortunately have kind of passed away. And I wonder what impact that has on how you think about the service. Is, is, is there a commitment you can make to these kinds of um, services and systems that maybe last 30, 40, 50 years as these objects become an important central part of, for families to, to reminisce about people who are uh, um, you know, um, a, a part of their ancestry? Have you thought at all about that, kind of the, the long term of, of these kinds of systems? Um, we thought some about that, mostly that um that we saw this as an, as an experience for these older people, but also really as an experience for ourselves too. Like if you think about your grandparents and the kinds of stories that they have that you haven't captured and um, they're getting older and older. So really any generation below or you know after would benefit from that. Um, and so, yeah, I guess, I guess for us it was kind of also thinking of a different way to archive things that people share with you, right? So every time we've, shared this concept with people or even kind of personal places we came from is, oh, I have a grandparent with Alzheimer's or, oh, I have a grandparent who right, lived through World War II and these are all experiences that start vanishing even before that person's maybe passed away because those intricacies just aren't really there anymore. Um, so, I guess, yeah, I, I don't know if we understood your question quite correctly, but um, I guess, yeah, we imagine that, I guess no matter where technology or systems that would hold this kind of content go, um, there would always be people who want that there because you always will care about your own personal family. And I think even business people who want to just like make money, 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 right? They always care about their family. Um, and that, I guess, is an incentive even them. to continue supporting this type of <laughs> content. Yeah, thinking about it practically <laughs> <laughs> on the real. <laughs> Thank you. Hold on, Mike. There's a question here in the back. <laughs> Cat Holmes. <laughs> Hey, um, beautiful project, thanks for sharing. And um, <clears throat> I was interested to hear a little bit more about your experience as designers through the course of this project. Because I do believe that one of the most important pieces of inclusive design is the inclusion of people in the process that, um, you know, both we as designers and then also the people we work with in our designs change through the process of creating some kind of solution. So I'm interested to hear kind of what it was in your journey in you know, spending that amount of time. It was clear that you had spent some real dedicated time understanding and getting to know the people you shared today. So love to hear more about that. How was that experience? Yeah, absolutely. It was a really humbling experience to be able to kind of be welcomed into the center and especially welcomed into um, Ichi and Yoko's home. Um, really. We had a really nice like time doing this. Um, we started to like have a really meaningful relationship. We like started. We gave them flowers, <laughs> and then we gra some of us graduated, and they gave us graduation presents. And then <laughs> and then we cried in the parking lot for I kid you not, 15 minutes. So, um, but I guess <laughs> I guess on another note, um, it was. Um, also kind of a frustrating experience because of how meaningful these um, like short-term visits and things like that were. It was frustrating that we realized that we could only spend X amount of time dedicating, uh, dedicated to research um, and spending time with these people um, and that we want to be able to develop like longer research um, cycles or like periods to this kind of work, especially with um, the idea of designing for accessibility. I think the other thing that was sort of different about our process is that we have this idea that you have to go in with this preconceived idea and then you go and test it and see what it's like. And we um, went there without any idea what we were going to see. We went there with a completely blank slate just to spend time there. And the knitting circle, um, those kinds of things that we observed uh, turned into the idea itself. I don't know if I explained that very well, but yeah, that we didn't already go there with this concept in mind. 
I think we really grew from that experience. So along a similar line, uh, I'm fascinated. I haven't asked you this question yet, but it's, it's, uh, it's been in the back of my head. So you're probably 20 somethings who likely fall asleep and the last thing to hit the floor is your cell phone or your smartphone, right? Because like all of us, you're probably on it all the time. And weirdly, um, the, the import of photographs to us has seemingly lost some of its meaning. I mean, I think about an Onion article that said, girl finishes uploading one million pictures of one week trip to Paris, <laughs> right? Like, we just constantly are flashing photographs to the point where it loses a great deal of meaning. So when you're embedded in your ethnographic research in this, <laughs> in this senior center and not crying in the parking lot, um, <laughs> And, and you see the importance that these photographs have to these people as a, not only as a memory, but as a way of knitting together a, an idea of the life that they led. How, did that change your relationship with the way that you're using photographs on your cell phones and the way you're taking Instagram photos of your food? I mean, did it, did, did it change your perception of that slightly? Maybe we haven't changed our perception, but thinking about the potential for digital photographs um, is interesting. Our professor um, kind of put it in this way that we're able to um, kind of make digital photographs physical again and create artifacts out of them, um, even just with the photos and not with the loom system. I think, I mean, I, I guess it kind of maybe has changed our perception, or maybe this is something we knew but kind of realized again, even though, yes, we are taking a million pictures during our one-week trip to Paris, right, there's always that couple that stand out. So every for every 50 croissants, there's like one of me petting this dog that reminds me of my dog that passed away or something that kind of sticks in my mind. So I think for me personally, it was kind of even realizing um, we both went on a trip together recently to Asia and even while being there, it was like, which of these photos am I going to care about later? Is it the cool lights in the elevator or seeing the reaction of my friends to those cool lights? Thank you. Thank you so much, Yudeb. Well, this is a wrap. This, is, this was really a group effort. It was months of liaisons and professors and students and volunteers uh, working together. So it's great to see it coming all together. And we all left inspired and hopefully different designers. And we have a showcase tonight. So all the groups are going to be in the showcase together with the Imagine Cup students. And it's from 6 to 8 p.m. at Thunder and Trident here on, on Building 92. And we also have another showcase tomorrow. And Lily wants to say something. All right, so thank you all for coming. Special thanks to a few people. Mike, who comes here all the time and helps us and has spent the last couple of days giving feedback. Thank you. And Carolyn, I don't know where she is. She's probably out there with Sarah, but um, say thanks to them on the way out. And special thanks to Melissa. <laughs> Melissa. She's coordinating this. You're a liaison, and you did all the brand and everything, and so thank you so much. It was, it was awesome. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, Lily, for being the sponsor and for Curtis Wong to actually starting uh, Design Expo. And for our crit oh, thank you so much for our critics. You guys were amazing. <laughs>